In this video, we will take a look at how to write the pseudocode for the merge sort algorithm. So, the algorithm which we are trying to write is merge sort. What should be our input? Our input will be an unsorted array. What is our output? It is going to be a sorted array. So let's start. Now we know that a single element array is going to be a sorted array. That is going to be our base case and that is the point at which we say that yes the array is sorted. We don't need to divide it further. So let's write the base case first. I'm going to give n the variable. I'm going to store, uh, let's say the unsorted array is array a. I'm going to store the length of this array in the variable n. Now, if n equal to equal to 1, that is it's a single element array, in such a case, I want to return. I will return a. Because that is going to be the sorted array of only one element. So this was our base case. Now, in all other cases, what are we doing? We are creating a left and a right sub array. So, we are going to create left and right sub arrays. So, these are going to be two new arrays which I am going to call left and right and they will have the left elements of the array and the right elements of the array respectively. After I have created these two arrays, what do I want to do? First, I will want to sort the subarrays and then I will want to merge the subarrays. So, let me say, I'm going to call um, merge sort on the left of the left subarray I've created and the sorted array which I will be returning I will store it in left itself. Now I will sort the right subarray. And I will store the sorted version of the right subarray in right itself. So I am updating left and right to its sorted counterparts. Now once I have the sorted left and the sorted right, what should I do? I have to merge these. So, I am going to say my merged array is going to be merge of left and right. This is the function we have already defined and seen earlier. So, once I have sorted left and right, I will merge it and store the result in a variable or an array, say merged array. Now I want to return the merged array. With that, I have come to the end of my merge sort algorithm. So it's a very simple algorithm. Given an array, I'm going to take the left and the right of that array and create new arrays left and right sort each of them and merge them. Now, while sorting, I keep dividing into left and right until I reach that my array only has one element. In that case, a single element array is always sorted and I can return that array. I've sorted both of them and now I will merge the left and right and I will return the merged array. So this is what we have seen when we discussed the algorithm as well in the previous videos. So when you write a program, the implementation can change, but the basic logic is going to stay the same. It's going to adhere to this pseudocode written. So let's take a look at what the running time of this algorithm could be. So we have t of n and we have two cases. The first is going to be our base case when n is equal to 1. 
when n is equal to 1, it's going to take a constant amount of time for us to return. Now, I'm saying constant amount of time and not unit time because it's going to depend on your implementation. Maybe you would give a print statement and return a. In that case, it will take more than just unit time of returning a. But nevertheless, it's going to take us a constant amount of time. Let's say that the constant is b. Now, for all other cases, what is going to be our time? So, we are going to do merge sort to the left. So, we are going to do merge sort to half of this array. So, it's going to be t of n by 2. Then, we will perform merge sort to the right. So, it's going to again do the same algorithm for this time only n by 2 plus t of n by 2 plus it's going to have the merge algorithm working as well. Now the merge algorithm works in a time which is going to be some constant say c and into the length of the left plus the length of the right. This we have seen already in our previous video. Now the length of the left is going to be n by 2. The length of the right is going to be n by 2. The combined length of the left and the right is going to be n. So it's going to have take the time of n into some constant c. So this is going to be the time taken for all other cases when n is not equal to 1. So looking at these all other cases, we can say that t of n is equal to 2t of n by 2 plus some constant c into n. This is going to be a rule for all n which is not equal to 1. So, using this rule, let's say that this is equation number 1. We can say that t of n by 2 is equal to 2t of n by 4 plus cn by 2. Let's say that this is equation number 2. Substituting equation 2 in equation 1, we say that t of n is equal to 4t n by 4 plus 3 by 2 into c n. So it's not going to be 3 n by 2, it's going to be, so this c n by 2 is going to be multiplied by 2. So we will get c n plus c n, so it's going to be 2 c n. Now if we see how we can get t n by 4, we say that t n by 4 using the rule stated in 1 is going to equal to 2 t n by 8 plus c into n which is n by 4. Let's say this is equation number, if this is equation number 3, this will be equation number 4. So, substituting 4 in 3, we say that t of n is equal to 4 into 2 which is 8, t n by 8, 4 into 4, 4 will cancel, we get c n plus 2 c n which gives us 3 c n. So this is equation number 5. As you can see, we can keep going on substituting for the t term in the equation. But what is the pattern we can identify? The pattern identified is the pattern we can identify is that t of n is going to equal to 2 to the power of i into t n divided by 2 to the power of i plus i into c n. This will be valid for any substitution. So let's say the first one, this is 2 to the power of 1 t n divided by 2 to the power of 1 plus 1 c n. In equation 3, it is 2 to the power of 2 t n divided by 2 to the power of 2 plus 2 c n. In equation number 5, it is 2 to the power of 3 t n divided by 2 to the power of 3 plus 3 c n. This is going to be always valid for any substitution. Now as you can see, this t term is going to keep on reducing. This basically means that 
when we are trying to sort n number of elements we are going to divide it into halves so it's going to divide it into half of the elements and another right half of the elements then when we are sorting to half just half of the elements we will divide it into a quarter and a quarter so this diminishing term just represents how our range of sorting goes on diminishing so at a point when we keep reducing this when we keep reducing this term this n by 2i is to the power of i is going to reach only one element that our range of sorting is going to keep reducing until we reach only one element to sort and at that point we return so at some point what is going to happen is we will say that t of n divided by 2i is going to equal to t of 1 so at some point as we iterate our substitutions as this term is going to go on reducing we are going to reach t of 1 that is the range in which we are sorting it's going to go on reducing and it's going to reach 1. With this in mind, let's take a look at the next step. So, what did we say earlier? We said that t of n is going to equal to 2 to the power of i into t of n divided by 2 to the power of i plus i c n. At some point, our range of sorting is going to become so small that this t of n divided by 2i is going to equal to t of 1. We are going to only be sorting one element. As seen in the previous, what we have said for t of 1 is t of 1 is equal to some constant b. So we are going to keep, go on reducing our range of sorting until we can sort our elements that is we can sort one element in some constant amount of time now from this what can we imply we can imply that at some point n divided by 2 to the power of i for some value of i is equal to 1 so now bringing 2 to the power of i up we can say n is equal to 2 power i taking log 2 on both sides we say that log to the base 2n is equal to i. Now we have found our value of i. So what must we do? We want t of n to be purely in terms of n. Only then can we find the big O notation. So we want to eliminate i from this equation. Now we have got i in terms of n so we can substitute. So let me call this equation number 6 and call this equation number 7. So, substituting 7 in 6, what can we say? t of n is equal to 2 to the power of log n, t of n divided by 2 to the power of log to the base 2n plus log to the base 2 n into c into n so this is separate from the log so what can we get from this we say that this is equal to now 2 to the power of log n is going to equal to n itself so this is going to be 2 to the power of log n t of 1 plus c n log to the base 2 n t of 1 we have already stated is a constant so this is going to be some constant b 2 to the power log 2n plus c n log 2n. This is going to be our time taken in the worst case. Now 2 to the power of log 2n is nothing but n. So this is equal to b n plus c n log 2n. So if this is our time in the worst case, now we need to find out what is the big O of this? So between these two terms, we need to find out which is the more dominant term in with respect to the growth of t of n with regards to n. 
So between n and n log n, which is going to grow more rapidly? Of course, n log n is going to grow more rapidly than just n because in this case, n is going to be multiplied by log n. Here it's only n. So this is going to be the larger term with respect to growth. So this is going to be the term which we will see in our growth of Tn. So now we say that Tn is order of, ignoring the constant c, it's going to be order of n log n. Or we can say that merge sort is order of n log n. This is how you write the pseudocode for merge sort and arrive at the running time and big O notation of this algorithm.